Welcome to Fem Lead, the podcast on female leadership and role models. This show aims to inspire and equip you with the tools you need to navigate your career plans. Fem Lead brings inspiring career perspectives and strategies to guide your path to success. Your host, Alexandra, will interview role models on new exciting topics with each episode. If you like what you hear, give us a review and subscribe to the show on your preferred streaming platform. Enjoy. Hello, all, and welcome to a new episode of Fem Lead. Today, we have a special guest that will tell us more about the world of sports. And I'm very excited to share this episode with you, as my next guest is a personal connection from back in the days, and it is always a pleasure to look back and see how our careers and lives have evolved. She is a former Romanian international tennis player and studied communication and sports marketing in the USA before joining the Romanian Football Federation as a corporate social responsibility manager and education specialist. For Euro 2020, she was the volunteer manager in Bucharest, overseeing a team of 850 people to ensure the city's four matches go to plan. She is now the education manager of the National Football Academy and leads engagement projects in the Romanian Football Federation. We're talking about women in sports today and how sports education can inspire a society. Please welcome our guest, Diana Pirciu. Welcome, Diana. It is a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, I was looking forward to your podcast and congratulations for everything you do. Thank you so much. We've, we've known each other for a few years and um, it's really fantastic to see uh, how lives change and uh, obviously how we are uh, how we are living our lives now. And uh, I remember when Diana went to the to the US for university, we were very excited about what does it mean and, you know, what will come out of it. And then a few years uh, later, you returned to Romania and then you started your career with the Romanian Football Federation, which I think it's uh, just uh, just very exciting. So today we want to talk about the world of sports. And we're going to touch upon some very interesting topics and Diana will share her advice and also some of the things she's noticed from working with education projects. And I think that's really an inspiring uh, setup to be in. So Diana, feel free to share any advice and any insights that you have noticed. I want to start by telling us more about your current role at the Romanian Football Federation. What does it mean and what do you do on a day to day basis? Yeah, so it's really interesting because what I do now, it's a career that I created for myself. So this is the first advice that I have. Sometimes you don't have to wait for a career to be there in order for you to have it. You maybe just have to create it before and then fill in, fill in the spot. So this is what I did in the Romanian Football Federation. Uh, I'm, I'm here for seven years already, which is a long, you know, uh, a long time. And now I'm leading educational projects uh, because when I was a child, I was doing both education and sports. And sometimes people would say that you have to choose between education and sports. So I decided to, to just tell them that, hey, you are wrong. So I don't have to choose. I have to go and do both. And I want to do tennis as well as I want to study. Uh, maybe I don't want to go to the sports uh, high school in Pitesh, uh, but I want to go in, you know, to a, a normal school. So uh, I, I, I do both sports and study. So now uh, my mission is to create to the football academy the most important educational provider of sports uh, uh, courses in Romania. And uh, it's not like I wish for, you know, the moon is because this um, it's, you know, we are lacking a lot of uh, sport educational courses in Romania. And we can see that in the results of sports people uh, in, you know, the international tournaments. So we need more educated people in order to, to take better decisions when it comes to sports. Mm, so that's, a very, that's a very good uh, reflection, I feel. And uh, thank you for noti- noting that also in your, in your speech. Yeah, you know, and um, now we just uh, focus on both on the pitch and off the pitch programs. And maybe I focus less on on the pitch uh, programs because I'm not an expert when it comes to football, but I'm an expert when it comes to educational programs such as business excellence in football management or women leadership or how to how to speak in front of the public or how to write a press release. 
So things that people should know before working in sports um, organizations. So they are more informed. And as I said, they take better, better decisions. So this is what I do now. Mm, that's very inspiring. And thanks for going into the details because like you said, uh, this uh, role is not something that you would necessarily find a LinkedIn add-on, but you were able to create it and you were able to see a red thread through which you can go and evolve also professionally. And I feel that's super important and very relevant advice. I want to ask you, you know, because you are a professional tennis player at heart and, uh, you know, did you know that you will have a career in sport management when you kind of, when someone told you, oh, at some point you'll need to choose, did you know that you'll strive for this? And how did you decide to stop your professional sports career from pursuing a different career path? That's that's an interesting question, and thank you for asking me this. Uh, because you know, as a as a kid, I, I wanted to be Kim Kleisters or Amelie Modesmo or a huge tennis player. But um, when you know years passed, I realized that I am not in the top ten in Romania, so maybe I won't be in top ten in the world just because uh, I needed to put in a lot of effort. And this, uh, when I say effort, I mean, of course, going to practices, paying for coaches, paying for mental coach, paying for um, uh, tennis coach and, you know, a lot of stuff, especially when we talk about tennis, it's a lot, you know, it's an expensive sport. So I had to stop and reset my objectives because now you're not talking to a failure, you are talking to someone who resets her objectives. So at the age of 17, I I told my parents that, hey, you know, there is no chance for me to be number one in the world, just because we as a family cannot afford for me to be there and put in the same effort as the others are putting in. So look, I have a a solution for this. Uh, So I don't stop playing tennis because I like to do that. And I can use tennis to get my education. So that was my objective in that moment when I was 17. So I stopped for dreaming about being number one in the world. And I started creating and working on my new objective. Uh, And that was going into university in the United States and get a full scholarship and try from there to build my career. And, uh, you know, I reset my objective at the age of 17. And then when I was 21 or maybe 22, I worked um, as an, int- actually, I did my internship in the events department. When, uh, when we talk about sports in the States, it's another thing, just because it's so much into the communities that I was so amazed that people were doing uh, corporate social responsibility through sports that, you know, I never heard of in Romania before, or volunteering. I never heard about volunteering before in Romania, or maybe when we talked about uh, organizations that we we met during our our teen years. But that was it. So uh, when we when I thought about volunteering in sports, that was such a new concept that I said, "Hey, I want to go back in Romania and develop such thing as sports volunteering or sports education programs, or invest as much as Americans are investing in sports." Uh, and education in the same time because I I had um, a scholarship for athletics and a scholarship for academics so this is how how I got into into the states so this is when I reset again my objectives and this is an advice that I give to myself from time to time that we don't have to keep our dream from a teenager to the age of 70 we sometimes need to change our objectives we need to the context is changing So we need to adapt ourselves in order to be happy. You know, we we don't want to be a failure. We need to to adapt. What a what a beautiful piece of advice and so true and so relevant to the times we're living. I feel like a lot of people are now realizing that maybe the trajectory that they set for themselves five years ago is not what they want and they don't know how to stop that and start something new. And career change is a real thing. The great resignation is a real thing. And what we see happening in the world is really, really a result of us having this sort of back and forth conversations with ourselves, but maybe not taking the steps to change it. And I feel like, you know, 
taking the time to know who you are and then change your mind based on what you discover, it's also extremely important for you to make those decisions. I feel that at the age of 17, to make that decision is really uh, well hard and also surprising. Is there anything that made you consider? Like, how do you decide at 17 that, oh, I should probably uh, think a bit about my my next few years in, in uni? What made you think about it? Yeah, uh, you know, sometimes it's good to know your motivations. So I always think about that. What motivates me? Uh, why am I doing what I'm doing? And at the age of 17, I just I just said, oh, what if I go to the States? Because nobody else did it before. You know, I only had a few, fr- few colleagues that uh, went to the States, but that was it. So I told my parents and my dad said, no one in our family went to the States. So why should you go? So that for me was like a motto, you know, like it, it was as simple as that. And that means maybe not that I have to prove them wrong, but I have to prove myself that I can do it. And I don't have to compare myself with others. You know, we come from a society when people talk about, hey, look what the other one is doing. Look at uh, your neighbor or the neighbor's daughter that is your age. So I, I grew up like that. And it's not, you know, I don't blame anyone. It, I'm super grateful what, of, you know, how my parents uh, treated me as a kid. But in the same time, that was the truth. So um, I had to prove myself that uh, I can be different. So I'm, I just decided to start working on my dream because it wasn't easy, of course. So I, I, I had to uh, learn from, for SATs and for TOEFL and then to take it again and to start uh, coaching in order to get money so I pay my exams so it wasn't easy but uh, when it's too easy that means that uh, maybe it's not my my place there Mm, that's that's super relevant for many people that find themselves uh, in a situation where they compare their trajectory with that of someone else simply because of how they were brought up not intentionally simply the reality of their context, you know? And I love the fact that you exemplify how you've used that for yourself to develop because many people would have been maybe more frustrated about this situation rather than, okay, you know what? Let's make a plan and let's try to take this uh, step-by-step, see where it takes me. So I find a lot of maturity in your speech and I'm very happy that you're sharing your story because I personally didn't know that and I'm sure that it will give a lot of people the maybe situation to imagine what would happen with their lives if they would kind of rethink a bit some of their decisions and why they made them yeah that's that's correct and you know I I it took me some time to realize that that was my motivation maybe I would have had some answers like oh you know it's um, it was really important for me to go into the best schools school in the states and we didn't have this kind of education in Romania but that was not true it was a factor that influenced my decision but the, the fuel that gave me the power to do that, it was, you know, my dad told me that I cannot do it. Yeah, that's very important. And I'm happy you had this reflection and now you can share it with us because it really shows that you are very authentic in what you are sharing with others and you're not trying to defend in any way the situation, but you're really trying to explain, hey, things are not necessarily brought up for anyone and everybody has to work for what they build. So it's really important that we we know all of these details when we consider our trajectory in life. And I'm very happy you shared it. So thanks a lot for the authentic uh, answer and uh, sharing all the details. <laughs> yeah, th- I have, thank you. I have a next question about, um, yeah. well, actually... It's not a question, but uh, everyone should know (laughs) that uh, this year you were portrayed as one of the top women in sports by UEFA for your contribution to the Euro 2020. So that is a huge, 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 huge milestone. Congratulations on that. You had uh, your own profile shared on some of the largest social media in the world by, uh, by UEFA, and that's really fantastic. What did it mean for you to be recognized for the role that you played in managing 850 volunteers who made the games yeah. possible in Romania. Well, so this is the story behind this, you know. So, um, uh, as I said, I came in the Federation in 2015 at the beginning of the year. And one of my objectives was to create a volunteering program. So I did that. And the name of it is Team Behind the Team. So I started small, of course, with a few people. But then 
uh, this opportunity came. Uh, we organized Euro 2020 in 2020. So uh, someone needed to be appointed to, to lead the program. So as I said before, at the beginning of our conversation, you know, sometimes you need to create your, your job. And in this case, a job was created, but no one was interested. Just because it was, ah, you know, volunteers, what's that? Not really fun for us. So I was there. Uh, I was, you know, I, I was 26 at that time. So I said, uh, you know, I'm interested in this. But my colleagues said that, you know, there are 1,000 volunteers that you need to manage. You never managed anyone. So I said, yes, but I'm ready for the challenge. So I'm ready to do that. It's not happening tomorrow. I got the job in 2018. So, you know, I had two years to prepare. So, you know, I'm ready to learn. Sometimes you need to, to hire for the skills and, you know, so hire for the attitude and train the skills. And this is where I am at this point. So I have the attitude. I have to, you know, train the skills, but I can do it. So just because no one else was there, you know, wanting the job, then they gave me the job. So I took it as a huge opportunity. And, uh, you know, I said, this needs to be the biggest sports volunteering program in Romania. Uh, it, you know, I was super lucky because it was almost the only one of, you know, these this big numbers, talking about these big, uh, this big numbers. And um, I started competing with other cities you know when we come we when we talk about uh, uh, volunteers that want to become a part of the program when we talk about recruitment phases when we talk about engagement so, on social media so i found competition on everything but you know it was a good competition just because we needed to have a lot of people interested in the in the program so uh, this is how i became the volunteer manager uh, and the face of the program of course and I uh, got in contact with WEF a lot. They were my employer at the time. So uh, they heard my story because I was always super pushy asking them for, hey, I need more help in this. Hey, you know, I want to do uh, to have an ambassador uh, who is not really aligned to your vision. So uh, they said that, uh, okay, Diana, we are tired of you asking us things. So... Uh, uh maybe that it that was what impressed them and this attitude of maybe being an athlete in everything i do this is what what they wrote in the article i remember just because um you know uh, since uh, i was little i always knew that i have to work hard so this is what i do now as well they just consider that i'm i'm a, a role model but I was uh, super surprised and happy for the recognition. But when it comes with super hard work, that is just, you know, rewarding and a happy feeling. But it's, it's not a surprise. It's not like, oh, wow, that happened. Just because you know how much work for, for that. You know how much, you know, you maybe you sacrifice a lot of things. Maybe uh, you don't go to all the parties, but you are there and you are there to put in all the effort to make it happen that's fantastic and it's also how much maturity to actually recognize your uh, worth in this setup because there are many people who instead would have said oh so surprising it was not the uh, you i don't know if i deserve this recognition or it was uh, so amazing to be with other role models but you know that you worked hard and i do really appreciate women who go to the table and say i really i'm very happy for this recognition i know i worked a lot thank you it just has another interpretation to the fact that you understand what it takes and you put in the effort and it's um, a very nice recognition, but it's also something that shows that you really put in the work. That, that's correct. And this is what I got from sports. So, of course, I learned a lot from playing tennis so many years. This, is, this gave me the attitude of giving before asking. And this is what helps me in the organization as well. And, you know, being uh, an entrepreneur within an, an uh, organization, this helps me as well. So I never go to my, to my manager saying that, hey, you have to call me a manager, then I will do this. I always, you know, hey, I do this. Can I do this? Look, this is my idea. This is why I believe it's good for the organization. I have the resources. We all do it for free. <laughs> and then if you are happy and you, if you consider that we deserve a promotion or, you know, uh, not, not even a promotion, maybe, you know, uh, 
of space in the newsletter, then then it's it's your call to to do it. But I have to put in the ball. It's not like I'm waiting for the other one to surf. So this attitude, uh, uh, which I gained from sports, helps me a lot in my my daily uh, you know job or interaction with friends. Fantastic. I love this interview. I didn't really know which way it will go because we can we can talk about uh, so many details, but I love how uh, clear and focused you are on, you know, connecting your athlete career with uh, working in a federation that, you know, deals with sports education and management, because obviously this is a totally different uh, ball game than uh, than what what you did for example in university right so it's like a different scale you had like you said the attitude and then you train for the skills you managed to um actually have a team of 800 people <laughs> managing the uh, volunteering setup but together with you so that the 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 football games would go well and this is really a fantastic story i really love how clear you are in in sharing the advice and i want to continue by talking about um your role in the education uh, in the education uh, sphere with as an educational specialist because this role is extremely important since sport is a channel that can make a difference in communities around the world where let's say opportunities don't come equally for all what is one realization that you had about the work that you do in sports when it comes to impacting communities yeah that's that's a great question uh, especially when Oh, so now I'm wearing this because I had, you know, before before our call, I had an intervention for a program uh, called volunteering in communities, role of volunteering in communities. So now I my I do my part. So I'm I'm trying to deliver the concept of volunteering to football clubs in Romania, and this is what you know uh, the Euro 2020 logo helped me, uh, you know, uh, be an expert in this so sometimes I, I believe that even when i don't wear the logo i wear the logo because i i represent the brand so now i represent the romanian football federation everywhere i go this is my employer so um, uh, my role is to make sure i do everything i can so i give back to the community now i'm talking about football community what i have learned and how people can use their power to influence the world. And now we are talking about volunteering or maybe the uh, social responsibility projects or including maybe talking about the project. Um, I'm, I'm coordinating a project which includes refugees in the community through football. So we are trying to use football as a, as a social tool. When I came here, of course, I didn't know anyone. I was in the States. My parents were in in Pitesh, which is a city close to Bucharest, but not Bucharest, where I'm uh, now. But I looked on online and I said, hey, what's the biggest sports organization in Romania? Because I wanted to go and work for tennis federation, but that was not what I wanted to do, just because they didn't have enough resources to, for me to implement my ideas. So I, I have chosen football just because it's the biggest sport in Romania, and because it gives me, it may give me the chance of applying what, what I think I want to do. <laughs> because of course, it's in 21, you just, or 22, you just think that you know what you have to do, but then, you know, reality kicks in and you have to, to adapt. And I did everything I could for now uh, in this manner. So I came back in Romania in 2015. In 2000, 2016, I went to school at the University of Bucharest to study educational psychology. So I uh, got my master's degree there. Then I went to uh, programs organized by UEFA and University of Lausanne uh, to study uh, sports management and football management and what that means and how football can influence the society. Uh, and of course, some some leadership courses there. And now I'm also part of the board of uh, WEFA Academy Alumni Association, where we want to create a lot of opportunities for people to get educated um, when they are already involved in sports. Mm -hmm. So uh, I try to I try to do my part. This is this is what I do. Definitely, I love that you you share all of the details also of your career. Um, trajectory when it comes to learning. And I want to continue this interview by talking about women in sports. When it comes yeah. to the world of sports, there is a clear pay gap between men and women's sports. 
what do we do about it? Is there something that we should worry about? Or is this something that you think will naturally go through a progression? What What is your view on it? Yeah, uh, it's interesting. You know, it's not my area of expertise, but I will give you my, my personal opinion on this. Uh, now that I'm working in a sports organization, I know how the funds are uh, happening. So, you know, where we get money from. Uh, so this is what happens when we pay the stuff, when we talk about men and when we talk about women. When we talk about huge competitions, such as, you know, soccer, football championships, then uh, the, the organization gets money from somewhere. So uh, we talk about TV rights, we talk about uh, um, uh, ticket buyers, we talk about uh, sponsorship, we talk about naming sponsors. So we talk about organizations that are willing to pay. So it's a circle here. It's not like people don't want to pay. It's how much, um, uh, how much cash flow or yeah. Yeah, so how, uh, how much does it cost or how much value does the women's sport bring? So how much money they get for the, for the women's sport? So uh, I think that we as athletes and, or we as women, we need to go and grow the, the game when, it come, when we talk about handball or handball or football or tennis. So the quality of the game needs to, to grow in order for sponsors to give to get more money or for TV rights to pay more money. So, you know, it's it's a circle here. This is how I see it. It's not like people don't want to do it. It's it's because the business works like that at the moment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So maybe, uh, maybe the TV viewers are more interested in seeing men playing than are interested in seeing women playing. But this is, uh, this is different from sports to sport because of course we think that uh, football is a man's sport. And you can see that in numbers, but now uh, UEFA and FIFA they are investing a lot in, on the in the in the, the women's sport. But in when you talk we talk about dance, maybe maybe that's you know when people want to see more of dancing when when we talk about women. So you know it's it's different. So I uh, now I, I find a solution for this. So the, the solution that I find for this is education. So let's educate people in order to grow the value of the sport so uh, people can can pay more so athletes can be paid more because now mm-hmm. we can we can compare athletes with actors because when we talk about the game of football we can compare it with a entertainment tv show mm-hmm. so this is this is where we are now uh, football became uh, more as a, an, an, an enter- entertainment when we talk about tv rights Very good point. And I I love the fact that you gave some insights into how the business works, because that's obviously uh, something very important to the way generally um, everything that has to do with the business itself is calculated. Right. So it's important to also know the the, the backstage part where, you know, how calculations are made. So thanks a lot for for covering that. If our listeners now would consider a career in sport management, considering that you're sharing a lot of insights here, what should they be aware of? Are there um, any sort of like uh, surprises that you had so far? Are there any sort of um, lessons that you have taken from your career and added them to to your uh, day-to-day work when it comes to organizing yourself? What should they expect and what should they be aware of? Oh, so uh, an advice that I got when I was young, when I was a child, was that tennis is a language that anyone can understand. So that that's something that uh, my coach told me and, you know, I got with me and I have it with me. Uh, for example, I go to EFA and people know that I play tennis and they say, oh, the CEO also plays tennis. So maybe you both should play. So that's a great opportunity for, for me to, to meet the CEO of EFA events, for example, and play tennis with him. Uh, so this is an advice that I had. So that helps me in my daily uh, uh, routine and, you know, uh, life. But just expect for things to change super fast. So we are working in a fast world. You see what's happening with technology and everything. So just uh, be ready to adapt, be ready to learn all the time. And, you know, this advice uh, applies to all the industries we work in. Um, just so, as I said at the beginning, set your objectives and try to um, 
work hard and just yeah, and learn and study and listen to the others and stay in contact with with uh, good people even when we talk about mentors maybe you have a mentor that you talk to from time to time uh, or your manager or your colleague just make sure you have good people around you that uh, force force you to be better a better person and before that try to define what what's what's the best version of diana and when i define that then i know how it feels when i have good people around me so now i have an office on it's an open space i have my colleagues here they are in the in the course now but it's such a pleasure for me to come to to the office and you know always uh, try to innovate in small things i have now it's this is a, a Back. No, how do you call that? This something a jar, a jar, a jar. Yeah. yeah, it's a jar with the leader. So if they do something good, then I give them something like that. And this is a, such such a small thing that people, you know, they are 26, 25, 27, so they are not kids. I'm not working with kids, but they are sometimes asking me, oh, so that wasn't a good idea. Why didn't I get a glittery, you know, Christmas tree? So you know, some need to be. You we need to be to stay. Uh, to innovate and stay um, uh, humble, you know, and try to try to uh, see what the others are expecting and try to be yourself and be authentic. Authentic. This helps me a lot. This come. This doesn't come. You know, this version of Diana. Uh, it doesn't come naturally. It comes after hours of working with myself, and you know, trying to understand why am I doing what I'm doing. Uh, how am I gonna? What what am I gonna say about myself? And uh, it's interesting to 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 find what defines you, and feel that hey, I'm in the right I'm in the right place right now. And don't always try to uh, expect things to happen. Go for them and enjoy the ride. Because of course I can now say that hey, I will be happy when I will do this. Yes, maybe you can be, you will be happy. But if you don't enjoy the, enjoy the process, what if you don't get to the point that you wanted to go? So um, uh, this, is what, this is what I do. And I try to not convince others, but give this energy to, to others. And as I said at the beginning, be, be the most, the best, uh, the biggest supporter of yourself. It's true. It's, it, if you are not believing in what you do, how do you expect others to do it? You know, if you don't believe in your podcast, you wouldn't convince me. It would have been something like, okay, I'm coming if you want to, but are you really sure you want me to come? So, you know, because you are so enthusiastic about this and you communicate so openly and you are there for this and you represent it because the, the project looks like you, then I'm always happy to be here just because I find someone as enthusiastic about uh, uh, he, her projects as I am about my projects. Hmm. So, so this is, you know, this is not the advice that some, but sometimes something that I do to, to feel happy of uh, my life and what I do here in my professional life. But that's, that's fantastic. And I, I love the fact that um, you, it's, it feels like the work you've done on yourself um, needed some time to um, sediment, have some sort of like uh, core values in place. And now that you know that about yourself, it's easy to pull each value and be like, this doesn't represent me. This represents me. This is something I'm eager to do. This is not something I'm eager to do. So <laughs> let's let's be clear about the direction here. And I love it because it's also part of your uh, personal journey, right? I mean, obviously you are now a leader in, in an organization and people look up to you and you say that they expect some sort of... Um, uh, recognition as well like you've probably expected at some point to be given the opportunity and then in order to know that the chances are higher you already started working as if you have, have had already the, the role right and then you're like I think I can do it but mm -hmm. let me show you how I would do it if I actually had the job and that those are things that in time you also become better at and you know framing a situation and, and I, I love it I think it's great advice I would call it advice because it's obviously based on your sure. experience so people have a lot of things that they can take from this. 
Yeah. 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 I hope so. And I, you know, I'm always, uh, I always learn from these discussions uh, about myself and it's good, you know, to put yourself in the mirror, even when we talk about virtual mirror and, you know, when you ask me something and I'm just, okay, uh, I don't have to give the answer that she wants to hear from me. And this is another uh, piece of advice because I've been to this position. Just say what you want to say. And this helps me uh, in the organization, in my personal life as well. It's good to have your own opinion. And if you don't have an, your own opinion, that's okay. Don't say it. Sometimes you don't, have, you don't have to have the answer for everything. And you don't have to, to seem like you are the smartest one in the room. Let others be the smartest ones in the room if they if they really are or if, if they want to pretend they are, because you have more to learn from you, about yourself when you say nothing, if you don't have anything to say. Definitely. So, this is what I learned maybe in the past two years. You know, I've talked now like I'm 56, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I always, you know, it's nice. It's nice to to get to know myself you know mm-hmm. sometimes I like to stay uh, alone not lonely but alone and you know spend some time with me I'm nice. it's very important as well because it's uh, I also have me time and um, there was a time now that we're approaching the end of the year like when we're recording this is almost the end of the year um, uh, I realized that at some point I started adding it to my calendar. It was also something that I had to do because of um, of uh, being honestly just overbooked and feeling mm-hmm. like I need a bit more time. So I would have a, um, an evening a week where I don't have any other engagements. And I put that in my calendar as free time, <laughs> meaning that it doesn't need to, I don't need to explain what I'm doing, but it's just like free time. And obviously if that, if it comes to that part is kind of like, how did you end up here or what do you do every day? And I sometimes have this realization of like, hmm, what did I do this week? Oh yes. But I think uh, alone time in, in the sense of kind of knowing yourself better and understanding some of the decisions you've made, why you did it, what did you think about? It's super important. And on that note, I actually would love to hear from you in terms of of tips or some sort of structure that you followed um when it comes to mental health you also said you had a mental coach when you were an athlete and you've you've uh, worked a lot with uh, obviously your mental health as an athlete can you share any tips or any sort of like uh, main uh, um main idea that keeps on repeating in your in your professional life now something that you learned from that experience yeah, I worked. I worked with a mental coach when I was in college, so I couldn't afford one when I was uh, when I was a kid. But um, uh, one of the things that I still do is uh, visualization. This helps me. Uh, you know, when when you play tennis, you visualize the moment when you ha- you know shake hands with your opponent and say that hey, I won, and you know you feel good about yourself. So that that's uh, uh, I learned in in uh, college. And now when I, when I run, for example, so I go on, or, or when I go in long walks, I imagine myself doing different things when it comes to my professional life. And it's crazy. Sometimes I imagine that, oh, okay, so I'll, I will get this award and I will wear this and I will uh, have this part uh, said in my speech. And it's so realistic that it scares me, but it happens. So sooner or later, that thing happens because it's so much into, you know, my, in the back of my head that I want this to happen. So this is one thing that I do. So visualization. Uh, the other thing that I do is uh, uh, Thanksgiving Day. <laughs> so Thanksgiving Day, uh, once a week, uh, I started it uh, uh, as a, you know, forced thing because I came home from the States and we don't celebrate Thanksgiving. But the feeling of gratefulness uh doesn't you know it's not really what we do here in Romania so I started doing that and writing there hey you know I'm grateful for this and here uh, I just want to say one thing it's okay one thing is to be grateful and one thing is to be sad sometimes you can be sad and grateful in the same time what happens is that I'm you know I'm grateful so I say hey I'm grateful for my job and for my friends and for my family but I'm sad because something, you know, different happened. But then I, I tell myself, yeah, but, you know, you have to be grateful because you are healthy. And I said, no, it's okay to be grateful and to be sad in the same time. That's fine. 
it's it's good that I had this realization. So you know, this is the second one. And the, th the third one, know yourself. So when I talk about know yourself, it's I like to be surrounded by people and I like to know that people can count on me. And if this doesn't happen, that makes me sad. So, you know, I have to, to invest or how, uh, how coaches say that put the light where, where you want it to grow. So if you had a plant, then make sure you don't forget it in the corner of your house. So make sure you water it, you water it and you, you have light on it. So it is the same with what you like to do. So make sure you invest in it. Yes, you don't leave it there. That's fantastic. I love the advice and I love the fact that you've uh, really prepared it in like three steps and what you've been through. Uh, it's very relevant for many people, you know, in terms of professional and personal growth. So thanks a lot for, for covering all of this. I want to move on towards the final five fire questions where Diana will uh, give us some uh, specific advice based on her recommendations. So the first question is, what is one book you think everyone should read? Okay, I, I would I would say the book the book that I read recently it's called the Ministry of Common Sense of Martin Lindstrom. So I loved it just because it's something that represents me so much. Sometimes we think about oh what we have to do, what others are doing, what people are doing, what the procedures procedures are saying that we have to do, but we don't think that hey it's common sense. Let's call that person, <laughs> and that's it. Let's call that person. <laughs> so it's a good book. Read it. Nice. What is the best piece of advice you have ever received? Uh, be your uh, biggest supporter. Very nice. Who is your role model? I have few role models. I take a little bit from each one of them. I don't believe in having one role model because you don't have to like someone from for everything that that person is doing. So I like someone from the personal point of view. I like someone from the, the professional point of view and someone else for, for the athleticism point of view. <laughs> if you were to have another career, what would you choose to do? Uh, I would have had uh, my tennis academy. So I would be an entrepreneur. Oh, fantastic. I look forward to those news in the future. <laughs> <laughs> and if you could change uh, places with someone, who would it be and why? Oh, I would change places with my uh, uh, with my employer from the States, who is a mom of four kids. So I was a babysitter for four kids. So I would change places with her for a month to see if I'm ready to have kids. That's very interesting. It's, uh, I, I was thinking you're going to say something like Simona Halep or some sort of athlete, but you, you are actually interested in understanding some other points of view, so it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Fantastic. Diana, thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. I love the fact that you have... Um, consistency in your speech and you really uh, talk from your heart and obviously from your experience thank you so much for joining us today it was really a pleasure and i'm sure the audience has a lot to learn from your experience i hope you've enjoyed this as well thank you very much it was a pleasure for me as well and uh, uh, i was looking forward to talk to you because uh, i'm a true true supporter of your work Thank you so much, Jana. And thank you all for following. Stay tuned for more updates from inspiring female role models. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Fem Lead Podcast. Share the news with your friends and follow us on social media at Fem Lead Podcast everywhere.